And lots of people keep saying to me, is it, can, is it nice to be back? And I say, yes. And then I'll say, really? And I'll say, yes. <laughs> <laughs> really, it's nice to, be, uh, nice to be back. It is a place like home, as they say. And it is nice to be behind the pulpit again. And the elders finally allowed me uh, back into the pulpit. Uh, and not because of any misdemeanors that, uh, that we are aware of. Uh, but uh, I'm glad to be visiting. I've had sabbatical leave. And um, thank you for affording us the opportunity to, to go away. Uh, it is such a good thing to build uh, sabbatical leaves into uh, into your pastor's uh, uh, call it package or whatever you want to call it, uh, because uh, we are only human and we too also need feeding and, and growing. So uh, Benito and I said, yeah, I'm going up the mountain, Benito, and uh, he said, okay, we'll make sure there's no golden clock cards when you get back. <laughs> and, uh, it is good. I listen to a lot of good sermons, and um, what I what I do is I listen to podcasts while I'm working on things. I like fixing things. I like using my hands, uh, carpentry and whatever. I break things and I fix them, and then I, I break them in the fixing process again. <laughs> but uh, in the process of all of this, you can listen to some good sermons and uh, a lot of good messages, and there's a lot of good things happening in our world. As you know, we had the opportunity to travel to the states. And uh, we hear all the bad things, as they hear all the bad things about South Africa. Uh, they think it's just crime and chaos in South Africa, and uh, to some extent maybe that's true, but there's a lot of good happening in our country as well. And the same is true in America, you can't just believe every divided nation. You think it's a first world country without any problems, uh, think again. Uh, in a lot of ways things are, are not well there, and uh, there's a real fight for the soul of a of America and um, so pray for our brothers and sisters there as they are praying for us here and it was good to meet uh, a lot of people uh, over there but there's no place like home and it's really good uh, to be back and uh, today we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse this is 1 to 12. Thank you to all those who held the pulpit while I was gone, those who preached and, uh, and, and brought God's word Thankfully, I only heard positive things, Peter and, uh, and uh, I said Paul and Isaac and Benita and Dave spoke, uh, all of those who, who held the fort. Uh, thank you for doing so faithfully uh, and, uh, and being true to, to God's word. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we're going to look at this morning. I actually wanted to start with 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and then in my preparations, I thought I can't do 9 before I do 8, because 8 becomes. Before nine and uh, and really lays the foundation for nine. You can't really understand chapter nine until you've looked at chapter eight. And so a one part sermon was it's now a two part sermon. And uh, so today we're going to look at uh, the first part of our second Corinthians uh, chapter eight. Let's pray before we do that. Lord, we thank you for your gift of grace to us, Lord. We just sung these songs uh, about the gospel, Lord. Uh, these songs of your goodness and your kindness and your mercies to us, Lord, for which we thank and praise you. We thank you, Lord, that we know the truth and that we have uh, found you, Lord. You, you've come to us and made yourself known to us, Lord God, and that we can call upon you by name. We come out in this miserable weather uh, because we want to hear your word, Lord. We come out, Lord, because we want to gather as your people and sit under your word together. Because we love you, Lord, and because you are our master, and we want to hear you speaking today. And so, Lord, as we come to your word this morning, we do pray that by your Holy Spirit you would speak to us, that you would speak through me, a mere mortal, but Lord, your eternal word, that it would be made known to us, Lord, and that you would speak and make your will known to us as your people, that we can live God glorifying lives and bring honor and glory to your name. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So keep your fingers in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I just wanted to say before we get into that passage, and as you know, may not know, I had a significant birthday uh, recently, and uh, a verse that keep come, kept, keeps coming and kept coming and will, I guess, continue to come to mind is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, which says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
I think that must be the theme of all of us for growing old, isn't it? Uh, let that be our recipe for growing old, that as we grow older, that we grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And many of you here who are older people, uh, you are more elderly, uh, more senior among us, and you are an example to us of what it means to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We thank the Lord for you and that you're setting an example for us in this in this way. Not growing old and cynical, not growing old and tired, uh, but older and stronger as, as you do. And as you grow older, you get to appreciate a few things a little more. And uh, like your eyesight that's now gone, or your hearing that's moving on, uh, there's a lot of things you might appreciate uh, now that they're gone, uh, your knees or whatever it is that you miss so much in your youth. Uh, but the older you get, one thing you learn to appreciate, I certainly have learned to appreciate this, is the gospel of grace. And the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, of what it means to be saved. Uh, and as you get older, you begin to appreciate God's grace. I always think of the woman caught in adultery. And they know the story where these guys bring this woman to Jesus. And they say, you know, the Lord commands and stone this woman. And Jesus goes down and he writes in the sand. And it says that the older men first left first. Do you believe the Lord was convicting them of their own sin as they did that? Because they said to them, you who are without, well, without sin, you'd be the first one to throw a stone. And theologians speculate about what Jesus was writing, could be in the law, could be all sorts of things he was writing in there, maybe the names of those men who brought this woman, mm -hmm. uh, this guilty woman, there's no doubt about her guilt and her sin, but he points out to them their own need for grace. He says, the older ones left first. As you grow older, you begin to appreciate more and more that you're a sinner and how you need God's grace as you grow as a Christian. The gospel of grace, both in terms of of its dynamic nature, of how it works, you begin to appreciate it, and how it works in us, our own need for it, how we all need God's grace, and Jesus died for sinners, and Jesus died for a sinner like me. And uh, the grace of God informs us, and informs really our, our whole worldview uh, of, in, in the way that we see ourselves, and in the way that we see others the way that we relate to one another, and the way that we, we relate to our Lord. It is really at the heart of all our conduct, isn't it? The gospel of grace, what Jesus Christ has done for us, that we are saved by grace. And you know that being saved by grace is not a license to sin, it is a freedom to do what's right. It's a willingness to do what is right. And so it affects us deeply, and it touches every aspect of our lives, our, our homes, uh, our relationships, uh, our everything, our, our work, our finances, uh, are all ought to be touched by the gospel of grace. There are no exclusive zones and areas, no those zones for God when it comes to the gospel of grace. There are no exceptions because grace informs our every, must inform our every uh, decision, our relationships. Uh, what we watch, what we do with our, our, our retirement, what we do with our leisure time, what we do with our employment, how we even see the way we work, and what we do with our, with, in, our, in our working lives. Everything we do, we know must come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ because of the gospel of grace that He has saved us and He has called us to live for Him. You know, it's so easy to sing Jesus as Lord and even to say, Jesus is Lord of my life, but is he really? Just look at your life and look at the areas of your life. And in particular, one area is our finances. Do we really trust the Lord to supply for our needs, to supply for our every need? Do you demonstrate the gospel in every area of your life, in your, in your family, in your finances, in your work? Uh, do you demonstrate the gospel of grace even in your giving and in your, uh, in, in, in your finances, the way that you manage your finances? It certainly must come through in everything that we do. And so our giving to the Lord says so much about us and how we are relating to our Lord Jesus Christ and to each other. You cannot do it as Jesus said, but God and money, because that is really, that's idolatry. 
And we know how money can rule us, and money can ruin us, and can be a source of so much temptation, as 1 Timothy 6 uh, warns us uh, so clearly. Recently, the church I know had a meeting, and my absence uh, was quite nice to, to know that the church is getting on with what the church needs to do without us. It was actually very encouraging to know that, um, that things are still going on and happening. Uh, but one of the issues that, of course, that was raised with the finances, the church's finances. And that caused a lot of stir. I know people came to, what do you think about this and what about that? And, and, and uh, when I got back, it certainly uh, created a lot of conversation in the church. And that's why I wanted us to talk and to start talking about the issue of giving. You know, as 1 Timothy 6 says, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap. And into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Mm. Now I always feel so unspiritual to talk about money and finances perhaps for some people. But we know it's so much at the heart of who we are, isn't it? We can't live with it, we can't live without it. Uh, money is one of those things that we need to address. Jesus often speaks about money and about finances and about giving, and so should we. So how do we prevent an unholy relationship with our finances? How do we make Jesus Lord of our finances uh, with our possessions, with our money? What is a, a proper relationship between you and money and the church? How should I give? When should I give? To whom should I give? How much should I give? And all questions that I've been hearing recently, uh, should we, you know, what are the principles that we should be uh, uh, applying in our, in our giving? What principles must govern us as New Testament believers? So I hope you'll find this interesting and helpful. The first thing is the principle of the gospel of grace in our giving. The principle of grace in giving. And in 2 Corinthians 8, 1-7, it says this, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, the overflowing joy and the extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. And so we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning to bring him to this, also to completion, this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in everything, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have, uh, and, and also in the love that we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. You see what Paul calls it in Corinthians? A grace of giving. He describes it as the grace of giving. Uh, uh, the Corinthians had sent money already that they had pledged to help uh, the need, uh, to, uh, given it to the, the apostles, and, uh, but it was incomplete from what we can see. That's the background uh, to what he's saying here. He uses this example, an example of another church, the Macedonian church, of how they had so generously had pleaded to be able to take part in this gift of giving, and uh, in the grace of giving as Paul describes it. And he, he uses this, this church as a suffering church. This is not an affluent, leafy suburb church that had extra to give, and that's why they gave. He tells the church, he tells us that this was a church that was suffering in severe trial out of their extreme poverty. So it was a, a monetary trial that even they were going through, that in that it welled up in this expression of joy, their, their overflowing joy welled up into this grace of giving and this gift of giving. And he uses that as an example to follow, and he describes it as a God-given grace. Not even their poverty could prevent their rich generosity because they because uh, because it was not beyond their ability because of their willingness to want to give. 
because it was a gift from God. Our giving to the Lord is a grace. It is a grace of God. It's one of the many graces that we, we have. One of the many things that we do that is a <coughs> gift of grace for us to be able to care for one another. It is a, a gift of grace to be able to care, to be able to teach, to be able to do all kinds of things that we do for the Lord. And likewise, even giving is described as a gift of grace. A great privilege. Uh, to, it is a great privilege to be in a position to be able to give to the Lord. But in terms of wanting to give, comes to know from the Lord. He puts that desire in our hearts. He's poured his love into our hearts to want to demonstrate that love by helping others. And also, it is a blessing to be able to share in the Lord's work. How can people be saved if they don't hear? How can people hear if someone's not sent to them? How can they, uh, how can somebody be sent? Uh, how can somebody go if they haven't been sent? And, uh, and you know the church has a responsibility to send out uh, missionaries and evangelists uh, to reach the lost in this world. And so it flows from this, we see in our passage here, this giving flows from and is as, as a result of this overflowing joy that was in their hearts. The joy that was already there. It was the source of overflowing joy and it flowed from their overflowing joy. They had this joy and the giving actually produced joy in others. Without the joy of the Lord in our hearts through salvation, giving will be a grudge. It will be a burden. Uh, it, but if, if the Lord's joy fills our hearts, it will be easy and natural for us. That even something we really want to do in terms of giving. Now our gift things are by the grace of God, we know. Whatever we are called to do, it is by the grace of God. And giving here is seen as a gift of grace from God, as Paul describes it. But as with all gifts, we know we can exercise them or choose not to exercise those gifts. God gives you, enables you to do something. Doesn't mean that it's just automatic that you're going to do it, right? That's where the obedience comes in, isn't it? That's where we actually have to respond to that which God has gifted you to do. There's some yeah, perhaps you have the ability to teach, but it's a stagnant, dormant gift because you're not actually putting your hand up and saying, I'll help teach the Sunday school class or I'll help uh, teach in a Bible study. And so your gift is lying dormant even though you have that ability. So having a gift is different to opening in the gift, isn't it? You can have something and then put it in a drawer somewhere Receiving something doesn't necessarily mean you're exercising it and using it. Yes. And we see that here, that they are encouraged to excel in this grace of giving. That they've already got the gift to give. I believe every believer is gifted to give. We all have the gift. Some are, are, seem to be gifted in a special way that they have an ability to make money and to bless others with that money, right? Some people seem to be know how how many things work, and um, and it seems like it comes easily to them that they are able to to generate uh, finances and and are and then again as a result they are able to bless others through their, their finances. But it is something that must be exercised by all of us. Corinthians had a, had excelled in many ways. This is. What you mean, two Corinthians? Yeah, not one Corinthians, isn't it? Because one Corinthians, there were there was a lot of work to be done in this church. But we see that there has been progress by two Corinthians. That God's grace has been at work in this church, and they've changed. They're a better church. Two Corinthians is a much more positive book, isn't it? It's a much happier book to read for a church than one Corinthians, uh, because one Corinthians has some very hard teaching. They were failing in some serious ways. Uh, and he clearly encourages them that you've excelled in many things, such as faith and speech, and the things in the message and the way that they were speaking, the, in their knowledge, in their love, they've done so well, they've really done well, and he encourages them in that. And they even sent this financial gift ahead, but it was incomplete, and it needed, they needed to finish this <coughs> pledge and excel in order to excel in this grace. So, Giving is really a service and a privilege to the Lord's people, we see in this. But verse 5 
we see it is first and foremost ultimately to God that we give. It is out of thankfulness and to honor the Lord that we give and then to people that we give. If we put it the other way around, our giving will be very selective. We will give when we when we feel like giving. We'll give when somebody feel when they when somebody is looks worthy of our giving, right? Uh, we, when the church council makes a, a decision to spend the church finances in a certain way, well I'm gonna withhold it because I don't agree with that. I don't think we really need that. And so and, and so then it becomes a real hits and miss affair. Whereas here we see that it is first, according to verse 5, it's first and foremost to the Lord that we give. And then it is to the needs of people. We need to see that priority, that it is a, a command from our Lord to give. And, and we ultimately are giving to Him. And then it is for the needs of people that we see we are, we are giving. Giving flows from grace. The grace that we have received from the Lord, and it is grace that we have anything to give in the first place, isn't it? The fact that God has given us something to give is a gift of grace from God. Their willingness to give is a gift from grace from God. And then that actual giving is an evidence of the work of the Lord in our hearts to give, to respond in faith, and in order to give, to exercise that gift. And so it's all about grace. We are saved by grace and grace alone. And that is, that is, that's thorough, isn't it? That, that means in every way, it's all about grace. But for the grace of God, there you go, how we often will say, if it's not for the grace of God in our lives, we can't do anything right. But if the grace of God is in our lives, we should be doing right, right? We should be doing what we know the Lord has called, called us to give. And this is why we give. This is our motivation. It's important that we start there. That's why I had to pause and take a step back from what I originally was going to be pointing to speak about this morning in terms of giving, because we've got to get our motivation right. The reason why we're giving, the heart of the matter, is the gift of grace. Giving demonstrates that the grace of God is among us, mm. that it has been shown to us, and that our love for Christ is real, and we want to. Uh, give back to him. It's not, and, and this is where so often we go wrong as churches in terms of whenever we speak about giving, and somehow it's put across as it's a best rewards program that there is. Mm -hmm. you know, don't you think these rewards programs are just rubbish? Hey, there we are. You join these things, you pay monthly premiums, <coughs> and then when you go to book your air ticket, you discover it's actually cheaper just to buy directly from the airline <laughs> anyway, or hire a car, and all these things they promise that are going to be cheaper. You know, if you put petrol in at this petrol station, well, it will be cheaper if you've got the special car, but you just drive down the road and it's cheaper anyway at the other petrol station without the car. Those are fake rewards programs. And so often we, we, we've adopted a rewards program mindset in our giving, and if I give, I'm going to get back. I'm going to join the rewards program today by giving to God. And we see that's really nonsense. It's not the reason why we give. We don't give to get more. We give because we've got already. Amen. We give because we already have to give. We give because it's already been given to us and everything we have is already a gift from God. And what we're doing is recognizing the goodness and the greatness of God by giving. So giving is all about grace, which brings us to the second principle of the grace of, in this grace of giving. And that is the sincerity that we see in verses 8 and 9. He says, I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. This saying is that because you're saved, you're already rich, right? You're rich in so many ways. You're blessed. Sometimes you have lots of money, sometimes you have less, right? But you're always rich in Christ. You have every blessing you you, you're a child of the king, and the king owns everything. <coughs> and all we need to do is ask if we need something, and if God thinks we need it too, well, he'll make a way for us, right? Mm. So we can ask. It's not, 
wrong to ask Lord my heart is breaking down I need some better transport or I need transport Lord or whatever the case I need job, a job Lord it's fine to pray for those practical material things it's not unspiritual or, or somehow materialistic or in some way or another that you are, are not trusting the Lord it's good to ask hey Lord you see my needs here and, uh, and the Lord will check our needs and our hearts in all of this but there must be sincerity in terms of our relationship with our finances and in, in our giving. You see, giving is, is not about Old Testament law, but grace. Now, this has been a debate in the church and a discussion about the law and the tithe and the 10%. Is the tithe biblical or unbiblical? People have been asking and asking me what I, what I think about it. Paul says here, yeah, I'm not commanding you I remember that Corinth was a Gentile church predominantly. There were Jewish people in there because Jewish people have been scattered all over the world, but it was predominantly a Gentile church. And so they're not, they're not the ones originally who had even received the law, and they're not being told now somehow they need to live by the law rights. But Paul points out here, importantly for us, that I'm not commanding you, I want to test your sincerity. Brings it to their hearts. Verses 8, 9, it says, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love. Now, the law can be very useful in many ways in terms of knowing how to give. And it gives us an idea. And I know a lot of people find the 10% principle as a very helpful principle. Uh, by all means, you know, people will use that. But if you really go into the law of giving, sometimes people gave 40%, right? Maybe you should push it to 40%, but I'm not going to put that on you today uh, because it wouldn't be biblical for me to say something. But if you really want to live by the law, sometimes it was more, sometimes it was less. There were different times and occasions that different amounts were given. But in general, it was 10%. And you know, a lot of people use that 10% as a rule of thumb, if you want, of how much I should be giving and, and I say that is fine, but we're still not under the law in terms of giving. If you use it as a guideline, that's where I think it ends. Because faith shows itself through works. And you might be in a position to give more than your 10%. And you want to give more because you really feel this is something important you want to give towards. But faith shows itself in works and it is obvious. That if we claim to love Christ and claim to love His church, that we must show it in tangible terms, not merely with words, but with deeds and with the things we do. And because we know, as I read from 1 Timothy 6, that money can so easily master us. We know how Jesus said in the Gospels, you can't serve both God and money. You cannot serve them both. You serve one at the neglect of the other because money can so easily entangle us and master us it is imperative that we make the Lord Jesus Christ master over our money by giving to Him what is His. And here He says we have the example of others who, like the Macedonians, show the way of true, sincere faith. There are some of you who really are not in a position to give and yet you give. I've been impressed over the years to see who gives and you get disappointed by people who don't give. And I try to stay out of that stuff because I don't want it in any way to affect my relationship, how I relate to you. This one gives, so you can sit down in the front special seats. And those of you who aren't giving, you sit in this corner over here. Uh, on the plastic seats will give you because they've been buying a nice comfortable seat. You know, in the synagogues you can buy your seat. You can get your name even labeled on the, on the seats. And uh, we don't fortunately have that in churches, our church at least. Uh, we don't have such a thing. Mm -hmm. But it is incredible to see the example of others. And I'm talking about now, I'm not talking about the Macedonians, but how some people who, despite their challenges and the severe poverty even that they experienced, still find it in their hearts to give, to want to give, and they do so faithfully. And well done to you. Because it is an example to all of us of how we should be making the Lord Lord over our finances, the Lord over every area of our life. And it is shown that, uh, that, 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 that He is Lord by the principle of sincere giving. In verse 9, He gives the ultimate example for us to follow. 
We've got each other, right? As an example of, of what it means to be generous. And always so blessed by the generosity of this church. We've got the Macedonians who are an example for us to follow. But Paul takes it even one step further to the ultimate example of for us to follow. That is in verse 9. Talking about Jesus Christ himself, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. He gave it all away. He incarnated himself. He gave up the glories and riches of heaven to come into this world and to live a really a pauper's life, to live a poor life, and gave up everything in order to that we might become rich in him, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And this is, of course, spiritual blessings that he's talking, all the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. You see how the gospel is at the heart of giving, at the heart of who we are, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself is our ultimate supreme example as the ultimate one who gave. He gave everything, his whole life, in order that we might live. Jesus gave up everything as a demonstration of the sincerity of his love for the Father and his love for you. So giving shows our sincerity of the sincerity of our love for God and for the things that God loves in a very real and tangible way. A sincere love for us, for example, in tangible ways like to see the word of God be made known. But here at heart of giving makes it possible that the word of God can continue to go out every Sunday and of course abroad as we support missionaries. It shows your love for the church and your love for the lost. These are all the things that are important to our Lord. Uh, it shows love for the lost and love for the saved. And love for, for missions. And so the gospel of grace can go out to unreached people through our giving. We, we just saw and heard again this week about Morocco. All these thousands of people that, that have passed away there. We know that's a very closed country. Yet Baptist missionaries in Morocco were expelled uh, because uh, they were sharing the gospel in that country. It reminds us again and again that there is still so much work to be done, right? The good news needs to go out into far-reached places, unreached places. And so by our giving, we make it possible that this can be. If we really think the gospel is so great, if we think it's the good news, we should want it to go out. And that proves the sincerity of our love. We want to see people who are, are suffering being helped, right? That's the sincerity of our love. And we show it in our giving. Time is watching on it. So thirdly and finally, the principle of willingness in giving. In verses 10 to 12, it says, And here's my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do so may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. You see again that principle that you've got, therefore you give. You don't give so that you will get. Uh, comes at night and, and we're going to leave it at that verse, uh, verse 12. He speaks here about the willingness, the desire. It's so easy for us to be moved in the moment, isn't it? I'm sure you're like me in this. We get moved by something, we see something, we think, I really need to do something about that. And then, and then you don't act on it, and then a day or two passes by, maybe some weeks go by, and you think, oh, I never really did anything about that, and it just wanes, and it wonders, and eventually you end up doing nothing about it. And it seems a similar thing had happened. This human nature had crept into the Corinthian church. They were the first ones to give. They were so moved by Paul's PowerPoint presentation that they were the first ones to give. I do know that you didn't have PowerPoint presentations back then. But they were moved to give and they gave. Uh, they were moved in the moment to do something. But that's not actually the same as doing something, is it? They had given something which was a good start, but they hadn't brought it to completion and done all that they said that they would do. Uh, it's, it's not what we feel or what we say about things 
but it's what you do about things that really counts, isn't it? Mm. And we see that here. We may be moved by a presentation that we see. I can have missionaries up here telling you about what God is doing around the world in different ways, in different places to see people come to salvation. We might be moved to give to those people. We can sign up for the newsletter and then we don't even do anything about it, making the work possible wherever that might be. We, once a year, we'll agree on a budget and we'll all agree on it. It's normally unanimous, a unanimous decision. But then we don't meet the budgets, which, and we, we show that we don't actually vote for the budget, but we don't meet budgets. We might hear a message on giving financially, and we might even begin the process, but then we forget to follow through. We don't act on that motivation, and our motivation grows cold, and so we do not do what we said we would do. Let's not be like the Corinthians in this. Let's hear God's message to us, to them, but to us as well. We prove ourselves willing but weak when we agree to something, but then we don't do it. We don't follow through to it. We prove that we don't act on our convictions when we feel we should do something, but we don't do it. And that applies to so many areas of life, isn't it? And in so many ways. We want to, but we just don't get around to it. We're just not organized enough. Or we're just not convicted enough. Or perhaps it's just for no good reason. We just quite simply overcome. And we don't act on our convictions to do what we know is the right thing to do. Now your situation may change. We know that things do change. You may find yourself when you agreed on the budget. Now suddenly you're without work. And your situation has changed. And, and so this limits it, it. It says that we must give according to to your means, he says. God has given us means to give, and he says give according to your means. And so there is not an expectation that, yes, you have nothing, but give it all anyway. And there's not an expectation that you should be impoverished by your giving to others. But whether it's much or little, as Paul's saying here, is in many ways irrelevant, isn't it? It's that willingness and that desire and sincerity. I want to do everything I can as possible to, to honor what I said I would do. It's a heartfelt willingness that makes it acceptable. <coughs> You'll know that story in Luke 21, and it, it's repeated also in Mark 12, about the widow's small coin. The widow's might is usually called it. Uh, uh, it she, she was dropped a little coin in the, in the offering box, a very small little copper coin, probably like a good call of one cent piece today. And you know, so you see one ten pieces now on the floor, nobody even bends over and picks them up. Because they worth nothing, and they were worth nothing back then as well. It was such a little, she has two of these little copper coins, which is about two cents worth. It's worth nothing. Nobody will even bend down and pick it up. But for her, she gave it. She gave it. And Jesus saw her heart and commended her for her giving of this little widow that she gave. She had nothing, but out of that, she gave all that she had. Because by faith, she was stepping forward and giving to the Lord. All the other people were giving lots, and these rich offerings that were coming in gave from excess. She gave from nothingness, and she gave what she could. She gave her everything, and Jesus commends her for that. She gave willingly out of her poverty all that she had from her heart. Jesus knows our needs and he understands if we are honest with him and honest in our hearts, we will give as much as we can, not as little as we can. Because we love as much as we must love and want to love more, increasingly, not love as little as possible. I want to close this morning off by just saying one or two more things. We all need to consider how the gospel has touched our lives, has touched our hearts how we came to know Jesus Christ and how that has changed us, how it has made us different, how, what difference the gospel has made in our own lives. How are we living up that gospel in terms of how we serve the Lord and how we give of our time, of our finances, of our, of our energy to giving towards the things of God. We also need to recognize the necessity of our giving in the spreading of the word of God. We believe that it is the good news that says you'll be doing everything you can in your power 
to get that message out and to enable others to get that message out so that people can be saved. Let me close with a quote by Donald Whitney. He's written a book, I think it's in the book, in the library, uh, Spiritual Disciplines Within the Church. If it's not in this library, it would be in mind if you really want to uh, read it. It's such a good uh, book on so many things in the church, and one of them is on giving. And in that chapter, he writes and he says, We should give because our love for Jesus Christ, because of our love for Jesus Christ, and because of our gratitude for His giving us immeasurable riches that we could never have acquired on our own. The hand that gives to God should merely be an extension of a heart that loves God. Mm. You should give to the church because you love the head of the church, and that is Jesus Christ. And that is ultimately the reason why we give. Let's pray that the Lord will help us. Let's bow our heads together. Let's come before the Lord in prayer and ask Him to help us in this. Heavenly Father, we do pause today, Lord, and want to first and foremost thank you, Lord, for everything we have. Thank you that you are a good Father who abundantly blesses us in every way. You have blessed us in every spiritual way, Lord God, every blessing from your hand. You're a good Father who gives every good and perfect gift that we have, the things that we need, the material things, clothing on us, Lord, and and shelter, Lord God. We recognize, Lord, that you are faithful in so many ways. You know what we need before we even ask. We do not have because we do not ask. Lord, we want to pray, Lord. We know there are people in our church who really do struggle, Lord. There are many pensioners in our church, Lord, who, for whom life has become very expensive on the little that they have. Help us like we see in the early church, Lord, for there to be love and compassion to help one another, that there will be no needs among us, Lord God, but we'll be able to be generous and kind to one another to help those who are less fortunate than ourselves at this time. Perhaps those who are, are going through a season of unemployment or struggling in one way or another, Lord God, we do pray that we would have have your, your love and kindness in our hearts to be sympathetic and compassionate to one another in this regard. We do thank you, Lord, for our church's finances, that you have shown yourself faithful over the years, Lord, providing everything that we need through the good times and the bad, as they say, Lord God, whether it's been a famine or feast in our, in our world, Lord God. Lord, you have been faithful in providing us with everything we need. We thank you for all that we have from your hand we recognize it comes. And Lord, we do pray today that you would help each one of us sitting here, here in this place, listening online, Lord God, to submit to you in this area of giving, Lord God, to allow you to be Lord of our finances, recognizing that you're the giver of every good gift and that you've already <coughs> blessed us so abundantly with so much to give. May we be faithful to act upon that and consistent to act upon that, Lord. Not just today, but, but going forward, Lord, that you would change us. If we are being tight-fisted and hard-hearted with our finances, Lord God, oh, release us from that burden, Lord God. Release us from that bondage that holds us. Perhaps our finances are holding on to us, Lord, too, too much, Lord. We are going to hold on to our finances. Oh Lord, release us from the love of money and the desire to want to get rich. Help us, Lord God, to be a great blessing and to use our, our earthly possessions and our gifts and our tithes and our offerings, Lord God, that they may be for your glory and your renown. We don't give, Lord God, because we want to benefit from it, but we give because we've already benefited from everything from your hand. We recognize that everything we have belongs to you. And so today, Lord God, we pray that you help us to be faithful in this area of giving, to make you Lord over every area of our lives, and not just the select things that we would like to give to you. So help us, Lord, we pray, to, to look to you, to trust you for everything as a church. And Lord, we do pray that you provide us with everything we should need to make sure that your word goes out, both here in Lakeside, in Mountain View, at Mountain View, 
and further abroad, Lord, as we support missionaries, that we might see the good news go out and hear many people being saved as a result of our faithfulness in this area of giving. Help us to help others, Lord God, to be a blessing to what we have, that you, Lord God, might use us in this area, and that we in the process would be blessed by being faithful to you in this. For this we pray now in Jesus' name. Let's stand, let's close with one more song this morning. And so we will look at chapter 9 and... Uh,